very much for joining us uh, this afternoon for this event around free schools and the education inspection framework. My name is Hannah Jackson. I'm the head of school programs here at New Schools Network and will be chairing today's panel session. So first of all, we are very pleased to welcome our three speakers today, all of whom have led uh, free schools through an officer inspection under the EIF, which was obviously introduced uh, back in September 2019. So all uh, the schools that we'll be talking about today were inspected in early 2020 and all received an outstanding judgment. So the th three speakers uh, that we have today are Stuart Locke, Chief Executive of Advantage Schools, which includes uh, Bedford Free School, which is a mainstream secondary based in Bedford which opened in 2012. We've got Marie McConville, who is principal of Harmonize AP Free School Academy, uh, which is based in Liverpool uh, and again opened in 2013. And we also have uh, Dr Jonathan Gray, who is the head of Calliwith College, a new 16 to 19 free school based in Cornwall, which is part of the Truro and Penwith Trust. Um, and they went through their very first uh, inspection under the new framework and achieved an outstanding. So well done, uh, Jonathan, for that. So in terms of um, how we will proceed today, we will have each of our speakers um, just giving a brief presentation for about 10 minutes each to talk about their experience of being inspected under the framework. They'll be talking uh, a bit about actually what happened on the day itself and the lead up to that and um, comparing to previous experiences of Ofsted inspections also reflecting on more generally on what has made their practice outstanding uh, across the board. We'll then have a uh, panel discussion asking uh, all of our speakers a few questions uh, for about half an hour or so and we'll then open up to questions from the floor for the last half an hour or so but please do feel free to submit any questions uh, throughout the session into the chat box um, at the bottom and I will um, collate those at the end um, and we'll sort of go to, to our speakers there. Um, as you have probably seen the little flashing light in the corner means that we are recording this session and we'll just be recording the presentations and the panel discussion but we will stop recording for the Q&A um, at the end so please do feel free to to ask questions sort of in, in confidence um, and I think in terms of sort of housekeeping rules I'm sure you're all very familiar with zoom etiquette if you just keep yourselves muted if you want to ask any questions anonymously you can do that by um, messaging me directly again just using the chat function so I think that's everything uh, in terms of housekeeping. Just at the end, um, there will be a quick poll, so please don't dash off uh, until we have uh, launched that. And we'll also be sending out uh, a number of resources and things at the end of the session as well, particularly for those of you who are facing uh, or coming up to your very first Ofsted as well. And um, there'll be some further um, events coming up around that in particular as well. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Stuart for the first of our presentations. Thank you. So much Hannah. Uh, good afternoon everybody, it's very nice to be here and um, welcome. Uh, my name is Stuart Locke and as Hannah said I'm the Chief Executive of Advantage Schools. We're a very small uh, multi-academy trust uh, based in Bedfordshire. We run a currently a secondary and a primary school. Uh, I've been very hands-on during both of our Austin inspections in January of 2020 which is why I feel like I've got some authority to come and talk here. I was also the principal at Bedford Free School, the secondary school which achieved the outstanding um, from 2017 onwards. Um, and uh, I think it's worth starting by saying that the inspection that we had at Bedford Free School we asked for. So we, so I phoned the regional HMI, I asked them, the senior HMI, I asked them for a section five inspection. And the reason I did that is because Bedford Free School was a good school, but we firmly believe that under the new evidence inspection framework that we could achieve outstanding. And if a good school has an inspection, normally it, it gets a section eight inspection, as I'm sure you know, a section eight inspection can't change the grade. It can only recommend that the inspection after that is a section five. Uh, we didn't want to wait another three or four years. Um, so we asked for a section five inspection. It's also worth knowing that you might remember a year and a half ago, two years ago, there was lots of stuff about potential off rolling across the system. And when the inspectors phoned and said, you're having a section five inspection, actually a week after we had a section eight, uh, our primary school Elstow, they said, even though you asked for a section five, we were going to give you one anyway, because we've detected unusual pupil movement in the school. Um, and we had to talk about the context of Bedford. Uh, and they went line by line through every child who's ever left our school for the last, I don't know how many years um, during the inspection. So it's worth just being on top of all that. I have to say, by the way, of course, there's no um, off rolling or anything that happens uh, in our school and they didn't obviously find uh, anything there at all but they are extremely thorough and it's worth knowing what happens there and I guess that's the first thing for me to 
to talk to you about. The reason that we asked for a inspection uh, and a section five inspection is because I and I think the the trust that I run is uh, we're big fans of the new inspection framework. I know not everybody is, but we felt like we'd come across a situation where the focus of Ofsted was aligned with the way that we've run our schools for the last four years or so. And as a result of that, we felt like we were significantly ahead of the game compared to perhaps some schools that had seen the focus of the evidence inspection framework on, you know, the substance of education, broadly the curriculum, and, um, and perhaps have gone, I'm not sure we've looked at our curriculum sufficiently. Curriculum has been at the center of everything that we've done at Bedford Free School and indeed at our primary, but at Bedford Free School, certainly since before even I was the, um, the principal there. And so we feel like the EIF really aligns with, with our direction of travel. So I'm not here to say that we managed in, you know, in between the new inspection framework being launched and January of 2020 when we had our inspection to turn the school towards the direction of travel of Ofsted, it's been a long journey towards a school that we're really proud of. And I'm a big fan of the focus on the substance of education. I'm a big fan of the focus on good outcomes, but good outcomes achieved the right way. So um, perhaps in previous uh, Ofsted frameworks, it was possible to get good outcomes I don't know, by entering pupils for easier qualifications, by hot housing pupils with a very narrow curriculum, by extending the length of Key Stage 4 and teaching the specification at the expense of curriculum. Uh, I don't think that the focus of the training for Ofsted inspectors more recently allows schools to get away with that, get good results and achieve an outstanding Ofsted. There's much more on the substance. And that's the most obvious change, I think, that, we, that people talk about with the new Ofsted framework, the focus on the curriculum. As a result, unfortunately, in my view, we have people coming up with uh, intent implementation and impact statements on their websites, things for Ofsted inspectors to go and look at. Um, and I, I, I think that that's the wrong way around. I think that those colleagues who do that for understandable high stakes reasons, like how do I make sure that Ofsted inspectors know that I'm looking at the curriculum, I think are focused on the proxies that inspectors might look at at the expense of the substance of the really hard work of looking at the curriculum. So I think that we had intent, uh, an intent statement, but we did, we've never called it that. My vision for my trust is that all of our pupils will join what we call the community of educated citizens. What I mean by that is that all the pupils in our schools are entitled when they become young adults to share the knowledge that educated people take for granted. And our subjects that we deliver in our schools contribute to the knowledge that educated people take for granted. So one of the first things I did in 2017 at Bedford Free School was I asked subject leaders, what is the point in your subject? Not actually in an attacking sense, but in the sense of how does it contribute to the vision we have for the substance that pupils take away from our school. We didn't look at results. I'm not interested in whether examinations are gonna be, <laughs> examination results are, uh, con contribution to examination results. They look after themselves. I'm interested in the substance of what knowledge and understanding pupils take away from individual subjects in order to, um, to, to, uh, to contribute to our vision. And that, I guess, is our intent. That's what everybody hence can talk about in our schools because they can say the reason that we teach our subject is this, this is what we tend to do and that's how we, we start to break down what pupils will leave at at the age of 16. I also, uh, just talking about what people have called the three eyes briefly, when people talk about implementation, they often, I think, um, get really uh, caught up in the jargon. It's just the stuff that we do in order to make sure that what we intend pupils to learn happens, right? Like, i.e. teaching. So the implementation of our curriculum is the quality of our teaching, the delivery, the, um, the feedback uh, and things like that. And I think people get really caught up in it. I don't think you need to. It's just what we do to make sure pupils learn. And of course, impact is the hardest one, I think, sometimes because they, often inspectors won't look at your internal data. They'll look at your external results. And now that's we don't have a set of externally moderated results uh, over the last two years. But nonetheless, for us, uh, perhaps we can 
pick this up later, but for us, we, uh, we don't do any, any after school meetings in our school. We do 10 minute meetings every week where the head of department and the teacher talk about what have you taught this <laughs> over the last five weeks? So every week we do it, but it'd be year seven, one week, year eight, the week after and so on. What have you taught the last five weeks? What went well and what didn't go well? And what do you or we need to do about it? And that gets fed up to the leadership team. Uh, that's the focus of leadership team meetings. So in actual fact, everybody in the school who needs to understands the extent to which pupils are learning across the school. Um, and we're able to have quality conversations about where pupils are learning or where they're not and what we're doing about it in every subject. So every pupil gets talked about every five weeks in all of their subjects. Uh, and that's really helpful in terms of talking about impact because you can't put a load of data in front of inspectors. Um, you have to be able to talk about how you know that pupils are learning. Finally, we don't do any proxies like Moxteads or um, deep dives, practice deep dives or anything. The reason for that is that deep dives are a really good method for establishing the quality of a subject in a couple of days when you know nothing else. But we know our schools much better than somebody visiting a school for a couple of days. So, uh, you know, my expectation is that leaders in my schools are in every classroom, every lesson. I don't mean all leaders, but somebody visits every classroom, every lesson in a supportive sense. But as a result, we know what goes on in our schools. We know what we're expected to teach because our curriculum is so clear. But we also know um, like the quality of behaviour, like where things are going well and so on. And so we don't th see the need or a proxy of monitoring that Ofsted use for us to use it ourselves. We think that that's a mistake. And actually we think anything like a Moxted would probably uh, be counterproductive for our, uh, our colleagues. And I have to say, I, I, I can't promise this is the case, but I think it's the case. And certainly we try to make it the case. I don't think in either of our schools, anybody has ever heard us say we do this because of the Ofsted framework or because Ofsted inspectors will want to see it. Like we've never had that approach, but that doesn't mean that I don't expect leaders in our schools and me to know the Ofsted handbook. I mean, it, it means I do expect, I do expect leaders to know the Ofsted handbook, to be, to know what's going to happen when the call comes in and to have some good, um, to, to be prepared to manage the inspection. I don't really want teachers uh, or middle leaders doing anything apart from teaching the kids and making sure that the pupils are making progress according to our vision uh, until the call comes from Ofsted. Uh, I think I'm nearly out of time. But there's a couple of things I just wanted to say as little tips that people might be able to take away from th that we did. The first thing is that when you get the call as a head, uh, the first th the, the line that I have prepared for the leaders is when because you get a call and then the call and then they say we're going to call you for a, a, an education focused discussion in a, in you know half an hour whatever it is and I get them to say would you mind my CEO being there that's me uh, would you mind the uh, my Senko or deputy head being there and and somebody and then I also get somebody in from administration to take notes that you've got a collaborative understanding of what the inspectors are going to focus on and when you brief the staff a bit later on you're able to not only have had a, a many-way conversation with the inspector but also you have a collaborative understanding that's that's deeper better about what the inspectors might be coming to look for um, and I think that's a really a really important um, it's a really important start because you don't get the chance like you used to in old frameworks as a head teacher to manage the inspection and managing inspectors in the same way. Like your job is almost done after the call. Um, I realise I have so, I've got so much to say and we'll, we'll talk, I'm sure more in the conversation, but I realise I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna uh, move on. But, but uh, the final thing is there are, and I know Hannah will, will send these out, there are um, uh, some of the lessons from our inspections and wider on our Advantage Schools website, which you are obviously welcome to look at and, and use. Uh, and you're welcome to contact us if there's anything you have any queries of or you want me to, to share with you. Uh, good luck. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Stuart. And yeah, we'll certainly pick up on uh, some of those points in the discussion. Um, Marie, I'll go on to you next. OK, thank you. Um... My name is Marie McConville. I'm the principal of Harmonize Academy. Um, Harmonize Academy is an alternative education free school. Um, we opened in September 2013 and we had our first Ofsted in um, January 2015 and we were outstanding. Um, and so our second Ofsted happened in January, um, the 14th and 15th of January. 
I think pretty much all of the panel, I think we all got inspected on the same day, um, which is really, you know, a, a coincidence really. So we were ins inspected on the same day. Um, and that was our second inspection. It was a sec section eight inspection um, as we were already outstanding. Um, and I'm just gonna really talk about the practical steps that we went through in preparing for that inspection. I think the, the preparation is, is really key and for, um, for you to embed practices, um, you know, right away from when you're preparing for your inspection um, it is really key to, you know, having a successful inspection to reduce any stress, um, stress that your staff may encounter and so that you can really react quickly once you get the phone call. Um, and so that's all down to the preparation. So looking at practical steps, we put a lot of practices in place. Um, we had executive summaries for key areas um, of our school. So we had executive summaries, which were a two to a four page document that gave a summary of our attendance, our SEN, our safeguarding, teaching and learning, our quality of education. And we had all of those documents ready I think we, you know, really sort of had everything in place about two years before, you know, we had our inspection. Um, so they were really useful. We had those on file. We had an overall summary of what we did as, as a school, which gave the context of the school, um, gave information about our curriculum, um, and all of that information was there really that we had on file. Um, and we had um, a document really that we had ready really just to prepare us for when we had the phone call um, and what the processes would be once we got that phone call in, which really helped us. So it went into sort of every detail when, the, when we got the phone call that it would be transferred to myself. Um, we'd already asked whether, you know, you could have other senior leaders within the room once we got the call. Um, and so I had the vice principal and our assistant principal, um, you know, we were sort of really prepped that we would be in the room once we got the call and that we would go through everything together, really. So just to say, when we did receive our call, I think it was about 10 o'clock that we got a call. Um, and it was a lady um, called Gail, um, who was the PA of the lead inspector. And she really, you know, explained everything very clearly about what would be happening. Um, you know, just told us to, you know, really relax and get ready that the lead inspector was going to call us and exactly what they would be going through on that phone call. Um, so, you know, obviously the is um, the um, inspection plan, we spoke through that. So we had a two day inspection. We had a team of three that came to inspect us over the three days. So we had a leader inspector, another inspector with her, and we had a quality insur assurance person that came in just to observe. Obviously it was the new inspection framework and he was there really to just ensure that everything was done um, in, in accordance with the new inspection. So we had three people that came in um, for the inspection. We had the lead inspector that was there for the two days. And we had um, the two inspectors there on the one day. So um, I'll just go through a document that we prepared really prior to us receiving our phone call, which was really useful. So when we received the call, we knew that that would that be transferred to the principal's office. We knew the documentation that we would have ready, um, the fact that we would need our timetable sending over, and we would need to upload documents. We had a map of the school ready for inspectors when they came in. Um, part of our preparation also was to have case studies. We had about 10 case studies for all of our students. So for any SEN students looked after children, um, those students that had reintegrated successfully back into mainstream, we had um, a variety of case studies that we had in place. And then we had um, thing, you know, for pupil voice, what students we felt would like to speak to the inspector, what parents, we had all of those lined up, as well as um, referring schools and local authorities that the inspector wanted to speak to any of them 
we had all of that detail down on that document. Um, okay, so just going through that. So um, when we had the inspection, um, we had the lead inspector that came in and um, they arrived at eight o'clock. Um, so she had a meeting with myself and then she um, had a tour of the school, met with all of our staff. And then at nine o'clock, they observed really the start of the day. So when our students came in and they observed exactly what happened, how we greet our students and all of those things were put in place. Um, and then we um, sort of had lesson observations and um, we were asked um, what subjects we sort of thought for the deep dive. So we were told that English was one going to be one of the subjects that they would be looking into as a deep dive. And then also our performing arts that they were going to be looking at that. And then science as well. So they selected those three subjects. And basically for those, for the first day, every lesson really was observed um, by the inspectors for those subjects. They met with the teachers, um, the senior leader, you know, the vice principal was in all of those meetings and they went through the curriculum really. So really asking teachers why they taught things at certain times within the school year, um, looking at sequencing, um, looking at our curriculum and so on. So they, they, they spoke a lot about the deep dives and what would be happening within there. So the second day, it was just the lead inspector that came on the second day. Um, and she sort of, um, again, done some observations, mess up with staff, made phone calls to the local authority and other schools. Um, and, you know, she had sort of keep in touch meetings with myself throughout the day. Um, so this was something that was quite different from our first inspection. Um, you know, she didn't meet up too much with myself as the principal. She would meet up with the teachers and staff, senior leaders, um, and then just sort of keep in touch with me over the two days and flew back how things were going. Um, and then obviously met with governors and then we were sort of given our outcome on the second day. So um, our report was published on the, I think the 20th of February. Um, and, you know, the impact of that report, um, you know, when you sort of read the report, it's written um, for, um, you know, parents and carers to read the report. But, you know, um, I think the inspector really understood our school. We had an excellent report, um, you know, that was even picked up by the media. Our school remained outstanding. Um, and just the impact really on, you know, our students that, you know, they were to so, so tell that they, you know, were outstanding and, you know, the impact really for our staff, it was just a really positive experience and it went well. I mean, I can go into more details a bit later if anyone's got any questions specifically for alternative provision, you know, we can sort of um, discuss how that may be different to mainstream. Um, but yeah, it was a really positive experience for us and, you know, the school has, has grown and, and, and really, um, you know, had a great impact really because of that process. Okay. So. Lovely. Thank you, Marie. Um, yeah, we can uh, potentially share that, that document afterwards if uh, we're struggling to get it up now. Um, and yes, we'll pick up on, I think, some of those uh, points uh, particularly relevant for AP uh, afterwards as well. Um, John, I'll go to you next. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Hannah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I, I was very conscious of the fact I was going to go up third and I was worried of two things. One, I'd just repeat exactly what the two people before me had said, or even worryingly, I'd say something completely different. I think the reassuring thing is actually I'm going to say lots of similar things and, and I'll echo a lot of, of what, what Stuart and Marie have already said. Um, uh, my name's John. I'm principal of a, a college down in Cornwall. We're a 16 to 19 specific um, academy and a single academy trust at, at that. We opened in September 2017 um, and we've now got just over 1,200 students predominantly studying at level three with a, a bit of level two, plenty of GCSE resits and other um, wonderful policies that we're mopping up for uh, in the sort of local community that we have to deal with. Um, 
and we were inspected in January. And I, I hadn't clocked that we were inspected on the same day, but I can echo lots of things. We said that day in January, um, I was very glad of the things we had done and had learned some things uh, since there that reflected on, I was trying to work out what I could share that would be of use. And Stuart said something brilliant. I've never met Stuart before, but he spoke the, the best bit of sense. Um, lots of people speak in a long time. And he simply said, there is no magic document, no magic formula that you can just roll out. It's, it's bigger than that. And the new inspection framework is, to my mind, a really good alteration to, to doing what, what Stuart and, and Marie said of really getting part of what is it like to be at that school? What is it like to study there? What kind of institution is it? Um, and what I was most glad about when our report was published, that the report reflected the institution I thought existed. And I think that's really important is that you have to be um, as, a, as a leader in the new framework, you have to be sure that what your role is, is ensuring that what the inspectors leave with is an accurate reflection of the institution you believe exists and you exist in every day. And that's harder sometimes than others, but it's important you make sure that by the time they leave, that's that's what's there. And a, a key question that, that we were very fortunate, I think, to get a really good lead inspector, a key question she asked a lot through those keeping in touch meetings that I think is a really important question to bear in mind is, do you recognise the college I'm giving you the feedback on? Do you recognise the school I'm describing? And I think that's so vital because the last thing you want to do is leave that inspection process thinking, what didn't we show them? What didn't we tell them? Why didn't they see what we see? And you might have differences of opinion, but I think if through the process you're saying, well, I don't recognise that, and you're, you're finding ways to make sure that that's what um, inspectors are seeing. So the great thing is I'd, I'd echo loads of things. Marie talked about planning. You can't plan and legislate for the, the inspection process, but I think there's a lot of things you can do. And we had lots of very similar documents, the ones Marie uh, outlined. We had particularly of use to us was a 48 to 72 hour plan that could kick straight into action once we got that phone call to say, who does what? Who's responsible for what? Who's making sure things happen? Who's making sure the right emails that are pre-written are sent to the right stakeholders the right people so that you're not worrying about writing those at the time have those ready to go um, and don't overlook the basics with that planning we, we made no stipulation that staff had to be in the building but virtually every single one of them wanted to be there making sure their bit of the school was as good as it could be that their bits are in place so just simple things about unlock communicating when the buildings are unlocked who can get in when are there a bit of free down down our way in Cornwall? There were free pasties at lunchtime for people to keep them going when they were there so they could focus on making sure they were doing those bits if they wanted to be there doing it. Um, and making sure those communications were concise and clear um, and, and there. Stuart talked about those three eyes, and I was very resistant to the three eyes because I thought, why have they come up with new words for why do we do what we do? How do we do it? And what are we doing to improve? And where do the students go with this? Um, why have they come up with these three eyes? This is madness. What we did do a bit of, and teachers are good at it, is we kind of tried to talk their language a bit because we knew inspectors would come with this new framework. We knew getting inspected early on in a framework, they would be keen to follow the mark scheme, if you like, follow the handbook. And we just tried to have those internal discussions about if someone says, what's your intent? What do they actually mean? Well, why do you teach the blooming course? Why do you, Why should students do it? Make sure you're, you're confident to have those answers ready to go. So we didn't instill those things. We made sure people were aware of, of what it might meant. During the inspection, I think communication is key. And Marie said exactly the same thing. Stuart said it. Have plenty of people around that phone when the phone call comes in so you can all note things down. Make sure you know exactly what they're coming to do. Where are the deep dive areas? What are they What are they expressing uh, their anxieties they want to dig into? Make sure you've got multiple ears hearing it from multiple angles. And Stuart said, get someone from your admin team who's far better at note taking than you will be or other people in your senior team to make sure you get all the, the facts of that down. And then the challenge for senior leaders is to distill the vast quantities into clear messages of what is it we want to get across as a clear, a, a clear sort of key strength of our school tomorrow. What is it that we want to show them that they're not seeing already? And I think that's that's um, a, a really key sort of part of it. Um, and it's having those mechanisms pre-planned. If you have a keeping in touch meeting and they do say something you don't recognise as a school, how can you quickly say to people, look, the thing they're telling us they're not seeing is this. We do this every day of our lives. Why are they not seeing it? Make sure they see it in your area if they come your way. Um, I would say I, I too, I was part of a, an inspection under the CIF in 2016 that was outstanding at a big college. Um, it was very, very different. Um, under the CIF, what she said, you could stage manage as a senior team a lot of what happened, where they went, who they saw, who they spoke to. And if things were in difficulty, if you said, but look at the data, the data's brilliant, you'd send them off track. That's not so much the case now. 
and again one of the phrases the lead inspector kept saying to me when I was tending to old habits and trying to steer them down a look at the data route she kept saying it's not all about the data data is just one part of this it's all about the curriculum and the curriculum is everything and that's all of the the, the communication, the dealing with the, the mentoring, the pastoral, the academic, the wider development, it's everything. And I think that's a big difference under those two new um, new sort of frameworks. And that's where it's key, as, as Stuart said, I mentioned Stuart said, it has to follow through. We, I hate buzzwords and phrases. The one we did come out with was this idea of a golden thread that from trustees, through senior management, through middle leaders, through teachers, through students even, Everyone is saying the same thing. Yes, this is happening at this school because when you read the in published inspections, there is something that says, what is it like to be a student at this institution? That needs to be clear that trustees are saying the same things as senior leaders, as our middle leaders, as our teachers on the ground, as is the experience as reported by students in those groups. And I think that's that's absolutely, absolutely vital um, to do that. And then the key thing above all else, and, and I think both of the other speakers touched on this, the key is you just need to know your pupils, know your school, accurately and honestly understand your strengths, your weaknesses, your areas for improvement, and make sure that, as I, I said at the beginning, keep sense checking, is what they're feeding back to you what you know your school to be, because you know your school best. Stuart said exactly right, It takes they've got two days to do a deep dive, to find out where they're, make sure that they've seen everything that you know exists all the time and, and like I said plan as best you can but recognize that under this framework your job once you've taken that phone call once you're managing the communications out stuff once you've done your initial presentation to welcome them it's then over to everyone else in your school that do the really hard work day in day out to deliver the outstanding and good outcomes and be confident in making sure they know what to expect before you get that phone call um, because the great thing about being inspectors as a new school is you do know it's coming you do know a rough time frame of when it's coming. Make sure those things that are in your control are planned and ready so that when they do arrive and they take their inspection the way they want to take it. And we had seven inspectors, one inspector shadowing and a quality assurance lead as well. The place was buzzing with Ofsted inspectors. They did go where they want to. They spoke to who they wanted to. And to my mind, they asked the right questions they should have been asking about. Yes, you say there's lots of extra curriculum. What about your HCP students? Do they take part in it? What about your free school meal students? Do they take part in it? Wanting to know, are you doing, is that what you claim the school is, is it the same for all of your pupils and not just the ones who would always opt in? Um, but overall, I, Hannah and the team asked me, did I think it was a good experience? Did I think it was a, a fair reflection when they left? And I suppose it's easy to say that when the report is really good, but I did feel that by the time they left, they saw the institution we saw, they identified things that we could improve that we agreed with, but on the whole, they had really tried to get in the mind of what is it like to be a student at that school and, and how is it that the whole school operation impacts on the quality of education for them. And to my mind, that's a better system than taking them through a charade of pre-prepared people and just saying, look, the data's fine. This bit of data in particular, that bit of data is fine. It is a holistic thing. Is the school an outstanding or a good school? I think that's what Ofsted inspectors should be doing. Um, so hopefully I've reiterated, but not just repeated what um, other people have said. No, thank you, John. That's been that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, I've just got one question from the floor that I'm just going to direct to you now. Um, DR, so you mentioned you have seven inspectors. Um, she just asked how big your school is. Well, that was proportionate to uh, people numbers. Well, 1, 000, just over 1,200 at the minute. Um, we were just under 1,100 at the point they came. Um, so the previous inspection, we had 5,000 students. We had 16 inspectors. So I was, it was smaller than that, but it felt like there was a lot of them. It felt like they saw every inch of the, the college. And I think they really they did uh, push and, and probe into every dark corner to make sure they got, the, got to the truth with that many. Um, but yeah, that was kind of what I was expecting numbers wise. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Um, so we'll go to um, further questions, um, as I say, sort of towards uh, the end. Um, a first question. So something that came up and John, I really liked how you sort of phrased the role of the leader um, being around making sure that uh, inspectors leave with that accurate reflection of, you know, what you think the school is and what you, you know, your vision for the school is. Uh, and one of the things that came out in our uh, discussions with all of you uh, in prep actually was around that 
the role of the head is much more hands off um, in these inspections. I mean, what would you say? How would you summarise? And John, you've, you've done this very succinctly, but Stuart and Marie, you know, how would you summarise that role of, of, of school leaders? And how do you think that that sort of feeds into um, the overall rating for um, leadership and management in terms of actually being kind of present and, and speaking to inspectors? Yeah, Marie, I'll go to you first. Okay, so. Um... Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that I really struggled with because I was, um, you know, involved with the first inspection and basically the principal was with the inspector the whole time and even going into lesson observations and so on. So, so that was a big difference, really. So in, within every session, the deep dives, the meetings with teachers and senior leaders, I was sort of hanging around thinking, you know, do I go into this session? Do I need, need to speak to the inspector? Um, and it was, you know, ex sort of explain that really that that's what they found that most head teachers were surprised that it was hands off and that they weren't meeting with them the whole time. They will keep in touch with you and meet you throughout the day and any questions they have, um, they will go through that. Um, but it's very much looking at what it is that you are saying that they will, you know, really check and make sure that that is mirrored with what your senior leadership is saying, what your teachers are saying when they ring parents, they will, you know, say, you know, for example, um, you know, we have PSHE and we bring adactions, drug and alcohol support in. And so we say we're doing all of these things. Well, they will ask parents, you know, that they're bringing this agency in. They will ask students if they meet with them so there's no stone that is left unturned they will check things and you know that is not to worry anyone um but you know I, I think you know they will check things right throughout the school that what it is that you are saying as a school is implemented and you know that every sort of person from students to parents and carers to other schools to your senior leadership are all sort of mirror, mirroring what you're sort of saying that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Like just that that golden thread that, that John was talking about. Stuart, have you got anything to add there? Yeah, one of the challenges of leadership, I think, is that uh, you become accountable for the work of others without being able to control exactly what they do at all points. And that's definitely the case during the Ofsted inspection. I find that particularly hard. Uh, I did like what John said about talk their language. And one of the pieces of language that I made sure that we spoke about a lot is that phrase, the curriculum is the progression model. Um, it's featured, I know, in Austin inspectors training, but it's a relatively new phrase in the system and packed into it is a load of um, really uh, like assumed knowledge about the nature of progress within different subjects. And so we, we talked about how we know that the pupils are learning the curriculum and that is progress without having to refer to data and so mm. on. And I think that's something important from the start. The second thing about the responsibility for looking after, um, for me, it was really important that my colleagues felt like the inspection was as low stakes as possible for them. So, it, you know, I remember I said in the briefing uh, that, you know, like if this goes wrong, it won't go wrong because one of your meetings has gone wrong. It'll go wrong because like we've, we've just messed it up somehow together and we do it together, uh, whether we succeed or we don't succeed, it's not responsible to any, any individual. That's, I just want you to do the things you do day in, day out that led to me asking for an Ofsted inspection. I mean, like that's that's all I need you to do, and that's I think that's pretty, pretty uh, like a pretty good approach to take. We during the phone call, as in, I think every officer inspection I've had in my career, and I've had a lot, um, the inspectors do listen to you on things about like colleagues who who might find things more difficult or having difficult times in their lives. We had um, they were going to do art. Our head of art was actually on. Um, maternity leave she actually ended up coming in because she wanted to tell the inspector stuff on the second day but anyway the um like the, they do listen to that and they do listen to your opinion on where the deep dive should be in fact I think of the five that we had in our secondary school four of them were ones that we'd identified and then they gave us a choice of the three areas where our data our external data wasn't as strong as uh, as elsewhere they, they were like which of those three are we going to go and see um, and, and they actually they gave us a choice and then said we're not doing that one we're going to do DT where we had 11 pupils take mm -hmm. the exam the year before now um, like unlike John and Marie I, I disagreed with the inspectors a lot 
And one of the strategies that we made sure is that my opportunity was in the team meetings. They say that we don't have to let you speak, but I didn't let them say that to me really. I like, I was quite bullshy about it, but we made sure that there was a repository, a place where, um, and it was, we did it electronically, although in previous inspections I've done mm -hmm. it manually, where any, um, where colleagues who had come across inspectors in any circumstances could feed back the nature of their conversations so that because they can't challenge it but I can in the team meetings that I'm able to attend and I thought that was important in terms of managing that as well um, and the only final thing to say is that um, although it, it doesn't feel, feel a bit like no stone unturned the purpose of the deep dives is to extrapolate about the quality of the school so actually if they're going in and they've chosen the deep dives uh, and they didn't really see anything apart from to try to look at behavior outside of those subjects they extrapolated from the subjects they looked at mm -hmm. did them in depth but then didn't look elsewhere so it's really important to colleagues to say actually some of you won't get seen at all um, and that's that that was important too so there's, there's kind of a lot you can do to manage the inspection but it but it is a case of like giving subject leaders their heads and and, and letting them go with it and i think that's um that's really important and, and we said mm -hmm. I, I, the final thing I know I've just I've spoken for a long time on this is that we like we just said like we want you to describe accurately what you do because that's what I've said on the phone um, and, that, and they're checking that what I said on the phone is right. Yeah absolutely. John in terms of the sort of deep dives did you have a similar experience in terms of uh, having a bit of choice there? Yeah no absolutely the, the part of the phone call there was there was some that were almost non-negotiable areas to have a look at but then there were ones that were were more open to suggestion or discussion and, and sort of would, would show the things we wanted to see as well as the things they wanted to see and, and that worry well i'd say the one thing that, that uh, although we were expecting there to be not a lot of observation of actual teaching and learning going on um there was far less time even than i'd anticipated of, of often inspectors the old-fashioned standing at the back of the the classroom with a clipboard watching and then disappearing into the night they didn't do that they came in and maybe watched for one or two minutes and then kind of stopped and talked to the students and mm. again wanted to see was it was that golden thread of if you say in your policies that this is happening is it happening or if you said this is a real strength is it happening can i see it happening Do the students know it's happening um and i think as, as Stuart said through the process communicating to the whole staff team what is going on is really good to keep that team morale going so that even if people are feeling I haven't been seen at all, they can support those people that are in deep dive areas. They can be of help to their colleagues and feel part of it. Because if you're not in a deep dive area, you can feel like well, I haven't seen a single single person all, 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 all two or three days. So I think that's that's an important thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. And um, my next question is around sort of self-evaluation. So obviously one of the things that um, OSA does part of the preparation is look at um, any self-evaluation um, forms of documentation that you have. Um, how sort of accurate do you think that yours was sort of compared to the, the final output of the report? And also how did that sort of feed into to your inspection? How much consideration do you think inspectors gave that document? So I go first. Yeah. On one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say we we did make the conscious decision to rework some of the headings in our mm. self assessment process to align with the framework because it seemed that makes sense, particularly in Ofsted yeah. year again to to convert what we were already doing into their language to make it easy for them to find the answers they were looking for. Just as you do if you're teaching students how to answer exam technique, if you're teaching them how to compile sort of BTEC work, I think it's that kind of thing. Um, I was asked the question by the inspector, who did you write this for? Mm. And we said, we wrote it for us, for our improvement, to make sure things were as good as they could be for the students. But we knew you were coming. So we did want to dress it up in a way that you would find that. The thing, again, I was surprised at is only the lead inspector had read it before inspection. She said, I've not sent it to my team. I don't want them to spend the entire evening reading your very elaborate thing. There are some key things I'd like to pick out of it and discuss, and I want to find those through the deep dive. But she almost said to us, I think you spent a lot of time making sure this is how you want it for me. Maybe in future, don't do that, um, because you've probably spent a lot of time on it doing something different. Um, and certainly I didn't have any real discussions about the self-assessment it, it itself or the document, but they were keen to check that what we thought and in a way, that's what Ofsted are doing, isn't it? They're, mm. they're assessing the honesty and the accuracy of yourself, appraisal of your own institution. Um, but I didn't have many discussions about the document itself. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was wondering if uh, you would have sort of moved it into to align with the new framework headings and things like that. Marie, um, what was your experience there? Um, yeah, so a bit similar to Jonathan, we did update ours with the new and you know the new framework really. So we sort of looked at our curriculum, and our quality of education, and put the three eyes in there. But basically, the document. Um, stayed the same and we uploaded that you know the the night before the inspection and um, we had it sort of ready in the room with that the team were going to be meeting so it was there but never really got asked much about it. Yeah just to say we uh, we, we do a self-evaluation every year we do it because it mm. leads to our development plan I don't think we amended it although we had already uh, made sure that it referenced important parts of the the framework um, and the only reference I remember inspectors making to it is in their team meeting where they said the school believes that, I can't remember what section is outstanding, like do, does, do we meet all of these individual bullet points for outstanding there? Um, I, and uh, just to repeat what John said, I did feel like the, uh, apart from the lead inspector, the other inspectors were not like, did not know that much about our school before walking in the door. And I think that's, that, that seems, I might be wrong, but that seems different to previous inspections. Mm. That's really interesting, actually, because my next question was going to be around if, if you felt that inspectors sort of got the context and took into account, you know, the in terms of people characteristics, in terms of the location of the school, you know, in terms of everything going on around. Um, and if that sort of fed in, if they if you felt that they understood that. So certainly they took into account for us. I, I talked about the unusual pupil movement and Bedford mm. has historically had um, a significant it doesn't anymore actually but significant number of surplus places uh, and and a number of families who in the move from three tier to two tier uh, education have have uh, hopped between schools and we they certainly listened to that um, and it felt like they would but we didn't really have any very long conversations about you know significant deprivation or anything mm. like that and I do get the impression that um, that so I do feel like they listen to us, but I also I also suspect that we colleagues will need to be careful not to be seen to be making excuses uh, by referencing particularly um, things like deprivation. I, I would anticipate mm. now that the pandemic's here, like like they'll probably frown on that's because of COVID and needing to really think about how we articulate those messages. So broadly, like I think so, but it was hard to kind of you know pick up. Yeah, absolutely. John? Yeah, I just, I, I mean, we down, down in where we are in Cornwall, it's a beautiful part of the world, but we've got the problems of rurality and mm. coastal. Um, we're bang in the middle of a peninsula. Um, some Lots of our students spend over an hour a day each way on a bus to get to us um, because of, of how the education provision is. And I, I mean, as Stuart said, I don't imagine there's many uh, school leaders in the country who would say our demographic is all perfectly affluent with no deprivation and no problems. Um, everyone will find something. And I think he, Stuart's right, the, the tone of it is key. You have to recognize the context in truth, uh, but not overplay it or use it as any excuse. Um, and sort of, it's good to say, despite these things, we've overcome it. The only time it came up in, in inspection really was when the quality assurance visit happened. He made it very clear to say to the inspectors, I want you to remember, this is the context of where you are. This is the the, the level of deprivation in the in the town that, that we exist in it does have morality it does have these things just bear that in mind when because in, instinctively inspectors will always inspect it, it, it compared to their own institution won't they and one of our inspectors who i had lots of sort of discussions with along the way she was from uh, greater london area sixth form college everyone lived within two or three miles trying to explain that some people live 30 40 miles away and come on a bus that takes an hour and a half is it, was take, it took her a while to get her head around that. So mm. I think it is important that you, you, you state the case, but as Stuart said, don't fall into the trap of trying to use it to explain away any problems or areas is, is, uh, for concern, really. Yeah, absolutely. Marie, obviously you're dealing with, um, you know, a very diverse cohort in terms of, you know, what pupils have going on in the home lives and sort of where yeah. they've come from and things. Okay, so yeah, I think our lead inspector really done her homework about the the context of the school. I mean, she'd scrutinised our website and um, got a lot of information from there. So she really went through that 
um, I think the night before, and she also knew about the the um, area, you know, that was a quite deprived area, and what were we doing in regard to safeguarding to make sure our students um, were safeguarded and so on, specifically in relation to the area. So she really done her homework on that. And um, importantly, she had experience of alternative provision and PRUs and um, really understood the, the type of school that we were, um, which, which was, was great, really, because I think that had been a, a criticism from, you know, when we sort of set up as a school, we were one of the first AP3 schools to open. Mm. There were only five of us when we first opened. And so, um, you know, inspectors really didn't have that experience of inspecting AP3 schools and so um, she had that background and had that experience so really understood the school and the students and so on so th so that was really good. Yeah absolutely and Maria I'm quite interested from your perspective obviously with um, people sort of being with you for shorter periods of time and transitioning in and out how do you sort of go around articulating what the, the three eyes look like sort of in the context of that you know where you're not working with people's right from year seven yeah. upwards um so yeah we we have a, a few things that we do we did have a list of pupils with their start dates on so you know it's also clear that we have students coming in throughout the school year and then also when they done the deep dives and done lesson observations and and they they you know went through the workbooks in those observations and and one area of good practice that we have with all of the exercise books that we have at the front of the um, book, you know, when that student started, because obviously you can pick a book up and, you know, someone's book will be full of work and that may be because that student's been with us for quite a while and then pick another student's book up and there's not that much in there. And so, you know, we put that information on the exercise book so they know when the student started and so they're aware you know of that movement that they may have only started two weeks previously and um and so the little things that we've done to um highlight that really the different start times and so on for those students mm, absolutely so i'm going to go to a question um that's come in from um some of the audience which i think is quite interesting and something we've touched on a little bit um already is just the sort of the difference between getting that balance right between preparing your teams and obviously having things ready to go so that you're not caught on the back foot and having to do you know stay up to you know the wee hours preparing um but also that kind of the benefit of, of doing things just for the sake of Ofsted um as your inspector sort of called you up on a bit there John uh, in terms of the, the self-evaluation and I think you know Marie you spoke earlier about um you know having things put in place a couple of years before even um inspectors came but presumably those documents whilst you know they were in anticipation of an inspection were still live documents that you were still using sort of on a daily basis and part of the, the sort of fabric and ways of working. Yeah so they were just really useful documents that we had and we would update them termly, we'd discuss them as a senior leadership team and so um, they were just sort of good practice that we you know had in place you know we um, wanted to do case studies of students that have made excellent progress and maybe reintegrated back into school and um, and not just for Ofsted, just for our records really when we're sort of looking at how we perform as a school. And so they were embedded anyway, but just to have that just really takes that stress away um, that, you know, you're not sort of thinking, okay, we're gonna get a phone call and we've got to put all this in place. Um, you know, over the next couple of months and, you know, then be there all night, you know, trying to get things ready for the next day. So as much as you can do as possible and um, to put that in place is really good practice, I would think. Yeah, I mean, it feels like the balance there is, you know, between obviously what will is required um, from Ofsted, but also, you know, what is actually going to be usable for you. And there's no point, you know, and there's the, the clear expectation that Ofsted make that, you know, you're not expected to produce things specifically for for inspections. Do you, I don't know if you just come in there. I think you can use that, that you're not expected to produce things for inspection. So when ins so inspectors aren't able to say, I need a document that says X. And, and in previous inspections, I've, you know, <laughs> been drastically trying to find something on the day. I don't think there's very much that teachers can do prior to an, an Ofsted call, actually. I, like uh, if they know, what they're supposed to be teaching over the year they know progress in their subject particularly at secondary school I, i'm not sure that there's anything much more that teachers can do i think there's plenty that leaders can do but i think that much of that 
if you have good governance is done anyway. So for example, you know, we had to account for every single exclusion that we'd had over the last, you know, fixed term exclusion over the last, I can't remember the length of time, um, like, but we'd done that for governance. So uh, that's, you know, that it wasn't too difficult to do. I guess that if governance is a bit weaker and you haven't felt the, uh, you haven't had to account for things like people movement, which I described earlier, which again, they went through line by line or, um, or, uh, or other aspects of behaviour or whatever it might be, then I guess the, that, that there might be a concern that that, that might not be available. But um, but, but for me, like, leaders need to know the Ofsted handbook and know what know the you know know what know what inspectors are going to see um, uh, and run their schools well. And I, and um, and we had a bit of the you know the document that Marie t described at the very start of this session I think is is super important because it just calms down people like the admin staff because they know what to do when you know an HMI is on the phone um, but but apart from that I, I like I think it's really hard to do lots and lots of prep anyway. Yeah John. Yeah completely I think listen, the, the key thing is you, running a really good school is important if you can then make sure that when offset come they are able to step out of their confines of three eyes and sequencing and recognize that normal teachers don't use those words, but good teachers do all those things anyway. It's just making sure they don't miss the point. Um, and I, I completely agree with you, you with, with students. What, what, what you need to do with the, with the staff is just make sure they know their game and know where they're going with their own teaching, their own practice. And a, a simple rule we sort of try and use, use here is we just say that we, we do education for our own kids. So, is it good enough for your own kids, your own niece, your own nephew? Is, is it good enough for them? If it is, if it's not good enough for an Ofsted inspector, they're asking the wrong questions. So I think it's just focusing on doing their bit to do the best. And, and we say with, with, with the leadership thing, just to go back to the point where you said, when the inspection comes, you hand it over to those people. You need to know that they know what they're doing on a, on a daily basis. You as a leader at that point can go and be a head teacher, be the person who is present everyone says they're present in the, the school they're part of the community you can go out and actually see people be part and almost enjoy the inspection because you are showcasing the really hard work you've put into establishing a school and yes there'll be things you'd like to be better but there are also an awful lot of things to be super proud of and make sure those things are, are coming across in the, in in that week or, or couple mm. of days yeah absolutely and we've spoken quite a bit about sort of curriculum and uh, subject deep dives and sort of the staff role in that um in terms of looking at personal development and behavior and attitudes how how do you think that uh, inspectors sort of got a sense through that and you know was those two days enough really to see all that extra uh, both sort of extra curriculars but also just the sort of extra life of the school really outside of uh, class time um I yeah i think it's again it's just it's just difficult isn't it in two days it's very mm. difficult to see exactly but two days is a long time to fake it. Um, and it's, it's very, it's very mm. clear. There's nothing, everyone will have done observations where you walk in, you ask a student, is it normally like this? And they go, no, never seen this before in my life. Um, you can't fake those things. With us, um, with Post 16, they were very keen to look at progression data. Mm. And where are they going? Is that intent being realized in the first place? Are they going on um, to, to good destinations? They, they were very keen on checking punctuality and attendance and again making sure what you declare about your attendance and punctuality in outward facing documents matches the reality when they're there and because again that's the one thing you can do is if you're a present um, figure in that school space through the inspection you can help make sure that those standards that you would like to set are being set during the time they're there but if it's the first time you've ever done it or it's the first time any member of staff has ever done it everyone's going to be thinking this is very strange so I, I think it, it's tricky in two days, but two days is a long time to fake it for mm. if it's not what you do normally. Yeah, it's really interesting, Stuart. So we, so we, we like we have a reputation for positive behaviour. We've had 300 visitors in the two years prior to the inspection to see what we do because we do some slightly unusual things. Our rules and routines are upfront and and obvious, and so um, and so like it, it just hit them in the face, I suppose. But the thing I do remember is that they, the inspectors, in as part of their deep dives, they're triangulating everything you've said. So they're not just seeing the teaching; they're looking at the books, they're talking to the pupils. But they walked out of lessons saying, "I want those." three peoples to meet me later on and I want to see the teacher later on not to talk about feeding back on the lesson but to hear about whether the 
whether that's the experience over time, what they'd learned before, whether the te- what the teacher says matches what the pupils say and so on. And similarly with behavior, like they chose the pupils. Uh, they mm-hmm. either chose them off a list because of characteristics or they chose them because they came across them in lessons. And I think if I remember rightly, and I might, may, I, I just want to qualify this that I might be remembering wrongly, but I think that was the only uh, meeting with the pupils where they didn't want a, a member of staff from the school to be present. Uh, they wanted to see the pupils without a member of staff present, um, which they we, we did check that they're entitled to do. Um, and so that was a, um, you know, we didn't have any say about who was in that room. Um, and I, th- I suspect that they triangulated that with the pupils everywhere, um, you know, but they would have got the same messages uh, around behaviour because we'd had so many visitors. And, um, and, you know, and the thing I said earlier about leaders being in every classroom, every lesson means that, like we have none of the stuff in our school about when a people when a when an adult walks into the room, no one blinks; they just carry on. So, and they would have experienced that kind of thing. Mm, absolutely, Marie, was uh, that sort of your experience as well? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the the inspectors will walk around the school quite freely, and they, um, as part of our plan, you know, they were sort of in our dining hall at lunchtime and we'll be chatting with the students and have something to eat with them, go out onto the playground and see students as they arrive into the school. And so I think they really get a feel for the school and we'll pick up um, on how the behaviour is managed and what you know the behaviour is of the pupils and um, you know freely walk into to lessons and so on and again as Stuart said you know we had a group of students that met up with the lead inspector and again she met up with them herself and and so could speak with them quite openly and honestly um, for the students so they really sort of pick up on that while they're there over the two days they'll pick up on the feel of the school and how the behaviour is.